So here we go again. Um, our next speaker, Avishai Ishalom. Um, he's been practicing uh, as an operations and software engineer for quite a long time now. Um, currently, he's leading a team of software engineers at Wix.com. And his talk will be about an engineer's guide to data analysis. So enjoy. Hi. Um, first of all, you've got five minutes to tell all the jokes you want about Wix. I know that the name is problematic. Um, nobody's going to file a grievance with HR if you tell like really good jokes. Um, maybe I will. So um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, metrics and graphs today, but on a more practical perspective. For example, we, we've heard a lot of talks about tools and about you know mathematics and um, various use cases, but not a lot of people talk about what should you be measuring, what should you be looking at. And this talk is more about that stuff. When, what kind of metrics do we want? Um, how do we design those metrics? Um, how do we see problems in our systems? So, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Wix. Um, we've got about 400 engineers. We've got about 1,400 employees. Lots and lots of websites, about 100 million of them. And uh, about 250 microservices. We've got offices in various locations. Those are just in engineering offices, and actually it's not updated. Um, basically, what I'm trying to say is that Wix is big and complicated, and uh, we do a lot of interesting stuff. So, yeah. Um, we're going to be using something called IaaS, and it's not infrastructure as a service. It's uh, kind of a demo application. Um, you know the sudo insult mode, where you know sudo insults you if you input the wrong password. So it's uh, kind of an extension for that. Uh, basically gives you random insults of an API. Um, I actually looked for uh, insult databases. Apparently, there are a couple of them online. Um, I don't know why, but um, we'll, using, we'll be using that as a kind of a, you know, a demo application or sim something to simulate on. So the basic architecture of the application is this. Um, we have an Apache load balancer. We have Flask. Uh, it's uh, basically a Python-based web server, application server. And then we have CouchDB, which is an HTTP database. And on top of that, we have Apache again. And, and why is that? Because we'll be using Apache both as a load balancer and also as um, kind of a probe to, uh, to get information about you know, latency and uh, response size and that kind of stuff. So basically, I'm using it as a uh, telemetry uh, collector, so to speak. Now, all the data that I'm collecting, both from the application itself, because the application itself is instrumented, and from CouchDB and from uh, Apache and all that stuff is eventually funneled into Graphite. And the way I'm doing that is the application itself um, sends metrics to StatsD, and StatsD sends metrics to Graphite. Also, I have CollectD. CollectD is a um, pretty common collector that a lot of people use. It co collects like CPU metrics, memory metrics, that kind of stuff. Also collects uh, CouchDB metrics. And I've got um, Logstash collecting the access logs from Apache and basically converting them into metrics, which are stored both in StatsD and Graphite and, um, and Elasticsearch. So basically, I'm using common tools that practically everyone in the room is using. Um, if, does, does anybody not know what StatsD is? Cool. OK, so it's very common tools that everybody's using. Um, and the idea is that I don't want to surprise anyone by doing something that you can't do. OK. So a few words on Graphite, um, because um, a lot of people use Graphite, and I'm going to be using that as a prime example on how you know, uh, metric collectors and metric systems work. So Graphite is basically built off a bunch of parts. Um, you send metrics to uh, carbon, sorry, Carbon Relay or uh, Carbon Aggregator or Carbon Cache, yes, you can send to any one of them. Um, they behave in a, bit, a bit differently. Um, the Relay kind of uh, does load balancing and sharding, replication. Uh, carbon Aggregator aggregates metrics, of course. Carbon Cache receives the metrics, stores them in memory, and eventually writes them to Whisper. Whisper is uh, kind of a round-robin database for uh, metrics. Now, um, viewing the metrics is done by Graphite Web. So Graphite Web uh, presents both an API and a, kind of a really lame, you know, user interface, if you can call it that. Um, and you would be using Graphite Web, you know, in order to view the metrics. Now, Graphite provides more than just view metrics. It provides 
um, the metric collector and the storage and the user interface, but also mathematical functions you can use to analyze your data, stuff like derivatives or time shifts or even whole twinters, if, uh, if you know what it is. And it's practically the standard in the monitoring world today. Um, I don't think anybody here is not using graphite or haven't used graphite in the past. So let's um, look at the problem that we have in our service. So remember, we have the fancy um, in IaaS service. So one second. Let me show you that uh, the console of the service. So th this is basically the service. Uh, it's got an API. It's got an API for random insults, for categories, and so on. I'm just going to show you how it works. I uh, issue an, an API call, and I get you know, a JSON with uh, the insult I wanted. That's basically it. Now, I used um, a load generator. And um, sorry, and this is what I got. So normally, the latency of the application, which is on the green line, sorry, one second. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. So normally, the latency of the application is below, um, you know, around uh, 500 milliseconds. And this uh, red line shows the SLA that we're expecting from the application. Now, around this time, we had a problem, obviously. Um, the latency of the application has risen significantly, and now it's, you know, uh, it's not, uh, no longer within the SLA. So uh, does anybody have a guess what the problem is? What might be the, might, the problem might be? Anyone wants to take a guess? No? This is kind of an interactive talk, so if you're not going to be talking, you can't proceed. So you have to talk. So anyone wants to take a guess, a wild guess maybe? OK, so let's look at the throughput. Nope. Actually, the throughput went down. So it's probably something internal. Other guesses? DNS. DNS, no. <laughs> but yeah, it's always the DNS, isn't it? It's always lupus. Hmm? Server doing backup. Server doing backup. Nope. This is something in. Sorry? Uh, no, I can show you the memory graphs. It's not that. No. Okay. How would you go about finding the problem? What graphs would you look at? Okay, I can show you the memory graph if you want. Let's do that then. So this is Grafana which is basically a better UI for graphite. So uh, graphite, and uh, let's add query, select metric, collect the memory. Uh, which metric do you want? Free? Used? Which one? Free. OK. Memory free. And let's see. Uh, we've got about three gigabytes of free memory. No, I don't think that's it. <coughs> Anything else? Guys, you're debugging here. We're losing money. <laughs> Do something. So could be uh, AC2, EC2 um, um, How would you detect that, actually? It's very intuitive. It's nice. But uh, it is your problem if you get fired for not fixing it. So, so suggestions. OK. Does anybody want to take a look at load average, CPU, that kind of stuff? Because we can. So I think it's this one. Nope, this is swap. This is load average. Looks fine. No deployments. Nope. CPU also looks fine. I await. We can look at I await. CPU I await or disk? disk? Disk. Okay. Uh, let's look at the disk. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think I'm not collecting that metric, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the cloud. There is no disk in the cloud. No, I'm actually not collecting that metric. But because I, I, I simulated the O, I can tell you it's not the disk. Um, no sorry? No random? No random what? Uh, no, there is random data, data from. Uh, I have metric. I have the entropy metric actually, so we can look at that. Nope, we've got we've got random. Yes. Okay. Does anybody want to take a look at the database? Maybe. <laughs> like the fact that I've instrumented the database should have been a big hint. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the lines here are the average latency for, um, for the application internally, not from the load balancer point, but from the, the Python point of view. And you can see it's risen slightly, but not enough to explain the problem. And uh, you can also see that uh, this is the CouchDB uh, average latency. And again, it's risen slightly from about, um, let's say, 57 milliseconds to about um, oh, like 87 milliseconds. Definitely not enough to explain the rise from 400 milliseconds in latency to about 900. So, anybody want to take another guess? What would you do at your job? I mean, what would you look at? Network traffic. Um, okay, we can look at that. So interface, yep. Let's look at uh, packets. Uh, we'll look at both. Nope, pretty much the same. Have you log files? Sorry? Have you got any log files? I've got the log files, yes. But uh, actually, I want to look just at metrics. But we can look and look at the log files. Um, but can we detect the problem only by using metrics? So how about if we look at the metrics, the same metrics we have now, just in a different way. Um, let's say that instead of looking at you know, um, average latencies, we'll look at, let's say, percentiles and see what we can see. So let's look at the application percentile, 99 percentile of the application of the Python. Okay? Now that looks completely different, doesn't it? Actually, it's risen started to rise here, not here even. So obviously the problem started a long time ago. Um, let's look at the database latency. Now this here is the application latency, and this is the, um, sorry, the database 99% of latency. So let's turn off uh, all the graphs that don't let us see what's going on. And so here you see, this is a graph of the average latency of, uh, from, from the application point of view. And this is the 99 percentile um, of the database. And you can see it correlates pretty, pretty well, actually. So I'm going to explain what happened here. Just one second, let me uh, sort this out. Sorry? Yeah, this is a simulation of locking problems in the database. Actually, the, the, the actual problem was, um, was packet loss between uh, the database and the, um, and the application server. Uh, that's what I simulated. But locks would behave in a very uh, similar manner. But what, what you can see here, that the 99 percentile actually shows us the, the problem very well. And this has been my experience with almost all database problems and a lot of different problems. You can't see them in averages. You just can't. But if you look at 99 percentiles and sometimes even 95 percentile, the problem just you know, screams at you. It's very, very easy to observe. Now, why is that? What we're seeing, basically, is the effect of queuing in the system. Um, the Python server that I've used only has one thread. So even a small number, a small fraction of slow transactions would basically hoggle the resources of that web server, and we will observe queuing latency that's very, very high. Okay. Now, almost all our servers have some kind of limited resource. Maybe it's a connection pool to the database. Maybe it's a thread pool. Um, maybe it's just um, 
you know, the number of files that you can open or the number of sockets. But even a small number of slow transactions would hog that resource and you would observe um, high latency from you, even average high latency. So if you're looking for problems, if you're debugging stuff, there's no point looking at averages. You should be looking at percentiles and maximums. So once we know that, let's actually have a look at the latencies. So first of all, I'll turn off the uh, database latency, and let's see what the user actually felt. So this is the application latency, the average latency. Now let's look at the percentiles. So this is the 99 percentile of the application. You can see it's actually a lot higher. So about 1% of our users actually felt latencies that were higher than two seconds. Higher than two seconds. How much higher? We don't know. We don't know unless we have the maximum of the entire distribution. So the problem with latencies is they actually hide the worst problems in your system. You have to remember that. If you're showing 95 percentiles, it means that you're throwing away the 5 percent of, of the worst problems that you have. Do you want to do that? Probably not. As engineers, we're usually interested in the problems, not in the averages. So I think it's time to go back to the slides. OK. So now that we know what we should be looking at, um, Maybe it's time to talk a little bit about you know, metrics design. How do we get that data that we need? So first of all, what is a metric? A metric is numeric data. Okay? Um, often comes with a timestamp. It doesn't come with a timestamp. StatsD is a good example. We usually slap one onto it. And it's a measurement of something. And it's usually discrete. It's not continuous. Because computers you know, they work in a discrete world, and ha nothing is continuous. And where do we get the metrics from? So usually we get them from three different sources, either from events, like the logs, and we aggregate those events, or count those events in order to convert, to convert them into metrics. Sometimes those events carry numeric data by, by themselves, and so we can just plot that data. Also, we sample stuff. For example, with a CPU or memory, we sample it every like 10 seconds or one minute, and we did get that data and create a metric from it. Now the problem with sampling is you know, we have errors. It's a, a discrete sample of something that's more high resolution, has higher frequency, or it's continuous. Think about temperature, for example, as a continuous metric that we're uh, sampling discreetly. And that creates a problem because we can miss stuff, like this peak over here, and we can actually have shifts. We can see the peaks in the wrong place, like the example here. Um, this is very common, and we get a lot of artifacts because of it. Another good example, what happens when you sample a metric with low resolution and the metric itself has a very high rate of change? Um, you would miss a lot of stuff. For example, all the nuances here just go to waste. We don't know about those peaks here, and of course we don't know that there were uh, more than one peak. Okay? We lose all that data. And this is an artifact of sampling. And it's a fact of life. We have to live with it. Now, events usually come in this form. Uh, they carry some data that is numeric and data that's not numeric. Why? Because not everything in the world is a number. For example, status. Is it OK? Is it an error? Maybe an error message. That's not numeric data. We can convert it into numeric data by you know, counting it and building, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, like term uh, histograms and so on. Now, a question. Suppose I'm collecting 10,000 events per second. And that's actually not a very big number, because if you think about you know, the rate of stuff happening in your system, for example, how many I.O. operations do you have per second? Thousands. So let's say I'm collecting 10,000 events per second, and each event takes about you know, half a kilobyte. How much data do I need to store one, for one day? Take a guess. <laughs> Too much is a good answer. Can I get a numeric answer? How much? 300 gigabytes? Megabytes? 
Okay. You've got calculators, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, it's about 400 gigabytes every day. Okay, um, just our access logs at Wix would take, you know, um, I think more than 10 terabytes a day, probably. So yeah, it's it's a lot of data. So it turns out that telemetry is really a big data problem. It costs a lot of money and a lot of storage to store all of your data. So if you're going to try and you know measure everything in your system, you're going to need a very large Hadoop cluster, and then you need another cluster that's twice as big just to store the metrics for the first cluster. So obviously that's not a solution. So what do we do? Normalize, yes, or aggregate. We call that aggregation. Aggregates, aggregates or aggregation, that's basically a form of lossy compression. Okay? We store much less data, but we throw away parts of that data that we think we don't need. It's like uh, MP3, for example, where you know, if you're not an audiophile, you wouldn't hear the difference, so you throw away everything you don't care about. So it's the same idea with aggregates. We just throw away a bunch of stuff that we think we won't need. The problem is, of course, that we need to decide up front what it is that we don't need. And sometimes we find that we made a mistake. We actually need that data, but we can't get it anymore because we only have the aggregates. So in many cases, when we can, we store the raw data, um, often in some uh, lower priority storage. Um, but when we can't, we just have the aggregates. So it's very, very important to know and, and to pick the right aggregate. Otherwise, we're going to have an issue. So the aggregates, almost all of us use stuff like yeah, maximum, minimum, sum, average. Also, we've got kind of weird aggregates, like last point in the time window or random point in the time window. Um, this is actually more common than you would think, and we'll, go, we'll be discussing that in a second. Also, we have percentiles and histograms or reverse quantiles. And each of those aggregates is suitable to, different, uh, to uh, different things. So for example, I've shown you why percentiles are critical for analyzing and finding L's. So averages, yes. Why are averages bad, especially with latencies? So if I shoot you in the head 10,000 times and I hit you only once, on average you're alive, but in practice you're dead. And this is the same with, with averages. Um, your clients don't feel the average latency. They feel individual latencies. And when you feel individual events, you don't care about the average. You care about the distribution. You care about the latency that you felt. Okay? Um, averages would be a good fit to cases where you feel the, um, the impact of all the transactions. For example, money in the bank. We don't care about money from individual transactions. We care about, you know, uh, how much money do we have in the bank at the end of the year? And therefore, average you know, money per month makes a lot more sense than 99% you know, of money per day. Okay? So when you're interested in capacity planning or you know, summing stuff up like money, then you would care about averages. When you're talking about latency, error, um, stuff that individual clients, um, when individual clients feel individual transactions, then you don't want to use averages. You want to use something else. And what do you, you want to use? You usually want to use percentiles, like P99 that we've shown before. So the definition of percentiles is um, the sample value, sample value that is larger than other, you know, some number, 99 in this case, of samples. It is um, a number that has been, that, has, that actually uh, was present in the sample. It's not an artificial number. And to compute percentiles, um, we actually need to store all the sample in memory or on disk, and we have to sort through it, and that means um, computation complexity of n log n. It's expensive. It's very, very expensive. If we try to compute, let's say, the 99 percentile of, um, of one day of, of transactions, we would need a huge cluster, because we have to store everything, and we have to sort through it, and that's very, very expensive. So instead of that, we have shortcuts. For example, maximum is pretty easy to compute without holding everything in memory. Just you look at two samples, you take the bigger one, you, can, you continue doing that all the time, and that's it. Pretty easy. Uh, there's no um, easy way to do that for, um, 
for any percentile, just for a few very uh, distinct cases. There are, of course, um, ways to estimate or approximate um, percentiles, and that's what we do when we have to get some kind of, uh, of number for, let's say, a percentile of a day. Now, percentiles are not additive. You cannot merge percentiles. You can't take percentiles from a few hosts and say, um, average them or, I don't know, take a maximum of that and say this is the um, percentile of the cluster, this is the P99 of the cluster. You can't do that. If you need the P99 of, um, let's say, a cluster of machines, basically you need to get the data from all the machines, the raw data, and compute that uh, percentile in an aggregator. So you would need to send all the data to a single StatsD aggregator or something like that in order to compute the, data in, uh, the P99. Um, this means we have to design that up front. If we need latency numbers for the entire cluster or entire service, we have to send it to a single, single aggregator. And if we want, in addition, the numbers per host, because often we would be interested in variations between the hosts, we would have to send all the data twice to two aggregators, one on the host and one that's doing aggregation per the entire cluster. And that's unfortunate. Instead, we can use histograms. So histograms are basically uh, what we call reverse quantiles. Instead of saying, give me the number for which, let's say, 50% of the sample falls below, we would say, give me the, percentile, the percentage or the count of numbers between, let's say, 0 and 28. And there we would get a bin. Now, uh, normally a histogram would, uh, would have evenly, uh, evenly spaced bins. The problem with the evenly spaced bins is that when we're talking about latency, the highest latency is the timeout value, which is sometimes 60 seconds. If you would hold you know, uh, buckets, bins, for every 10 milliseconds up to 60 seconds, that requires a lot of memory and a lot of storage space. So instead of doing that, we can have something else. For example, logarithmically spaced bins. Uh, first bin is, say, from 0 to 10 milliseconds. Second one would be from 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, and so on. That basically allows us to capture the long tail. Now, the good thing is about this histogram is that as long as you keep the bin sizes equal across the cluster or across the time windows, you can actually merge them very easily. You just add the, the count number for each bin. And then you can get a histogram for a cluster for an hour on, and so on. Pretty easy. So if histograms are so awesome, why aren't everyone using them? First of all, storage. Because instead of storing, storing one number per time window, we're storing a lot of bins. And that costs money. And also, we have to decide on bin schema, some kind of bin schema. Are we going to use uh, logarithmically spaced bins? Are we going to use linearly spaced bins? What would be the bin size, and so on? Um, and that means we have to know the distribution up front. Often, we don't know the distribution up front, especially when we're talking about problems. And the biggest problem of all, not a lot of tools support histograms. For example, Graphite doesn't support histograms. It doesn't visualize them, doesn't store them. So how do we, uh, we choose the right aggregate? Um, first of all, use histograms if you can, or percentiles for latency. Also use min maximum size for uh, latency and sizes. Because as we said, 99 percentile hides the 1% of your worst problems. Um, you can use histogram analysis for sizes and latency. It's very, very useful to understand the distribution and what goes on in the system. I'm going to show an example in a second. Um, one way of doing that is storing all of your transactions, or at least a sizable sample of them, inside the tool like Elasticsearch. Um, it costs a lot of money to hold the raw data, but you can do a lot more with it. Hold sums and averages for capacity and money, and aggregate per domain, per host, per cluster, the data center, and so on. And what you're looking at, what you're looking for when you're trying to debug problems is basically deviations, OK? We're not looking at you know, stuff that's behaving um, in a fairly consistent way. We're looking at the stuff that's behaving in a very inconsistent way. So this is why we want the highest percentiles, for example, and the lowest percentiles, and why we care about deviations and so on. So let me show an example of a histogram. So this is um, Kibana and uh, Elasticsearch, and basically it holds the same data that we, that we had for the problem that we simulated before. 
Same data we saw in graphite, just this time in, uh, in Kibana. So you can actually see here, this is the latency, the average latency graph that we've seen before. And this is the percentile graph that I'm uh, uh, creating from, um, from the data I stored from the access log. And here I can actually plot the maximum response size very easily because uh, with StatsD, I didn't aggregate it when I collected the data. And, but with Elasticsearch, I can do arbitrary aggregations because I have the raw data. So uh, presenting the maximum is pretty easy. And here you can see that the maximum wasn't far off from uh, the 99 percentile in this case. But often it is. And again, this is the graph for, uh, for CouchDB. And here you can see that the maximum latency of CouchDB was a lot higher than the 99 percentile of, uh, of the CouchDB transactions. But let's look at histograms. So here we can see the latency plotted on top, but we can see the histograms plotted on the bottom. So this histogram is for the entire time window. And here we can see that we, have, we actually have two modes. We have tr uh, transactions that are slow so here, and a lot of transactions that are relatively fast. It's a uh, bimodal distribution, basically. And this is the response size histogram. And you can see that most of the responses were roughly the same size. Now, if I zoom into the um, uh, problem window, we will see the distribution changing. Okay? And this helps um, to understand problems a lot better because we can see the changes in the distribution of response sizes and response, um, uh, response times. Uh, for example, now we see that if before we had a bimodal distribution, now all the responses are slow, most of them at least. And we have a very, very long tail. Now, long tails tell us about a lot about percentiles, because percentiles, like the high percentiles, are basically the long tail. So we'd see that now we have responses stretching all the way from about um, 500 milliseconds or even 300 milliseconds all the way to about two, uh, two milliseconds, which was the maximum transaction time that we saw plotted. Yes? Cool. So let's talk uh, about resolution for a second. What time interval do we want to, uh, to graph and plot and sample? So most of the tools usually have a default of 60 seconds. Now, a human usually needs about five data points at least to actually see a trend. So that means that with uh, one minute resolution, it would take about five minutes before we can even observe a problem. Okay? If you're making a change, a deploy, or something like that, five minutes is a very long time. Think about your alerting system. If you want to be alerted within, let's say, one minute, you need at least five data points. That means uh, sampling resolution of about 10 seconds at least. Okay? And I'm not even talking about the stuff that we miss because of sampling artifacts. So um, although a lot of people sample um, with 60-second resolution, I think that we probably need one-second or 10-second resolution at least. Um, you don't need to hold the data for long, actually. You can downsample it or sample in two different intervals and store the data, the high resolution data, for say a few hours or a day, just for alerting and debugging purposes, and store all the, the low resolution data for, you know, for a year or so. Now, the problem, of course, is that rollups and, and downscaling is very, very hard. And I'm going to show an example of that in a second. Now, um, you probably all know this quote, Mark Twain. Okay. The problem with a lot of our systems is not the stuff that we see. It's the stuff that the system is doing to our graphs and metrics without us knowing. And this is, a lot of metric systems actually do a lot of stuff that is really, really bad and we just don't know about. I'll give a, a few examples. So, one second. So Heinrich actually talked about this yesterday. I'm going to show um, another example of this anyway. OK, so this is a graph. And the SLA here was, um, for this latency graph was 150 milliseconds. And obviously, there's no problem, right? Like, the system is within the SLA. What happens if we zoom? Let's say here. Ouch. We've exceeded the SLA. Now, why didn't we see this before? 
Sorry? Averages. averages of what? Exactly. This is known as um, peak erasure or spike erosion. Basically, when a graphing system doesn't have enough pixels to plot, uh, say, 10 da data points, it would take an average of those data points. And that means that if the peak is very, very, um, uh, very small in, in, um, in terms of time, if it was a very fast peak, it would just vanish. Okay? So this is why you don't see those peaks uh, when you're zooming out. So let me zoom out for a second. And you see that the peaks have vanished. Now, there is a way to fix that in graphite, but not in all, uh, in all systems. So there is a function called consolidate by, and I'm going to add that function, special, sorry, one second, consolidate by, and yes, consolidate by maximum. And again, I need to know what I'm looking for, because I'm looking for peaks uh, on the upwards direction. In this case, I will choose max. And now I'm supposed to show the, to see the peaks, right? But I don't. Why not? Because it turns out that graphite and a lot of other storage engines as well, it's actually doing um, those things in two places. A, in the graph system, when it's presenting the data, but B, in storage. So when you, um, uh, when you, um, you create a metric, you define how much retention you want for that metrics. Um, for example, in this case, I stole high-resolution data for six hours, but after that, I stole low-resolution data. And what does Graphite do when it converts you know, the high-resolution data of, uh, let's say, 10 seconds to a one-minute resolution uh, for long-term retention? It averages. So I've lost the peaks. And this time, I can't even reconstruct the peaks. I've lost them indefinitely, okay, because it was in storage. So, you can actually see the example of, um, um, of consolidate by here when I uh, go to the high resolution data that's in storage. Now it's with consolidate by. And now I would remove that function. And the sharp eyed would see that, for example, this peak has become uh, much smaller. So, this is a really big problem for us because. Sorry? This is a really big problem for us because uh, not only are peaks erased, sometimes we, can, we, can, we can't recover that data. Okay? So this means we have to uh, design up front um, the retentions and the, um, uh, sorry, and the aggregation rollups of data. Now, graphite, uh, with graphite, you can actually customize the way it rolls up the data. So there's a file called um, uh, aggregation schema if, or storage aggregation, if I'm not mistaken. And in that file, you can define for a pattern of, um, of uh, a metric what kind of aggregation it would use when it rolls up the data. Should it use a maximum value? Should it use the average value? Or maybe the sum and so on. And for counters, for example, you might want to take the last sum because it keeps going up. For gauges, you would probably take maximum if you're looking for, uh, if it's a gauge that, you know, um, you're uh, looking for problems that go up. You would take the minimum if you're looking for problems that go down. For, think, for example, of a minimum uh, metric. Okay? So if you design the aggregations up front, you would avoid those problems, and you will be able to see um, the peaks that were supposed to, be, uh, to go away. Now, um, I, uh, don't forget one thing. The aggregators also do this. It's not only the storage. What happens when uh, you send, let's say, five um, metrics in one time window? Which metric would the carbon use, or whatever collector you're using? It can't use all of them, obviously. It can only uh, emit one data point for time window. So which one will it use? So carbon uses the last value. Okay? Basically, it erases all the other values and you get the last one. With StatsD, it depends on you know, uh, what kind of metric type you're using. Gauge would use uh, the last one, timers would actually use a bunch of aggregations, percentiles, and so on, and counters, again, would use um, uh, basically the sum um, uh, over a time window. So this is, again, why you need to decide up front on the type of metric, or you need to understand how your aggregator behaves, if it's configurable or not. Now, another problem is uh, uh, gauges having low resolution um, low resolution, and basically it hides a lot of problems. So again, I'll show you an example. So, um, 
So here you see you have uh, three lines. And this is the original metric. This is a high resolution gauge. Okay? And the first thing you'll notice is that metric behaves very differently in this time window and this time window, right? So do I have a problem? Did I do a deploy? Anybody wants to take a guess? Yes? Um, so the question, the answer is no. I haven't done any, anything. The system is actually stable. The reason you're seeing such a big difference between here and here is because of downscaling. This is an artifact, okay? It's not real. This is an artifact created by the downscaling behavior of the storage engine, okay? This is high resolution data, one second data actually, and this is um, 10 second data. Okay? This is how the metric actually behaved. This is what you see after the downscaling. And you would think that you would have a problem, but actually it's only the downscaling behavior of your system. And if you're, you're unaware of that, you're going to be spending a lot of time debugging a problem that doesn't actually exist. So let's zoom into the real data now for a second. And let's see how um, um, the same gauge just sampled in lower frequency behaves. Ouch. That looks completely different, doesn't it? Right? Doesn't look even remotely the same. So this is what happens. Let's zoom in. This is what happens um, when you sample in a lower frequency. You get artifacts. Okay? For example, this peak here is an artifact. You can see that there was no peak here. So what happened? Basically, when we do the um, low resolution sampling, we kind of sum the whole time window. And every, anything that happened in that time window would just go into one uh, dot, which is this one. So depending on the aggregation function we used, whether it was a uh, count or last one or uh, sum, we would get a different artifact. But it's definitely not a good representation of the metric. But this one over here, the blue one, is actually a better representation. And that is the derivative of, of a counter. So with a gauge, think about memory, for example. We can sample memory, or we can count allocations and deallocations and get two counters from it. And counters, as opposed to, um, to low-resolution gauges, they don't lose data. Instead, they kind of smudge it over the time window. So you can actually see it here pretty well. Um, maybe the, the color is bad, actually. C can you see the blue line? No? Yes? OK. So you can actually see that the blue line here is smudged. It didn't lose all of those tiny peaks. Instead, it kind of smudged them over the time window. So counters are preferable to gauges, if possible, because when you go to a low resolution, you don't lose the data, you just smudge it. Um, the data won't go away, it will just look a bit different. Sorry. So the TLDR is basically uh, use counters if you can. Um, try not to use gauges if you, you, know, if you have low resolution gauges. But, you know, you can't always do that. One of the problems is we don't always control the metric generators, okay? For example, JMX, you know, sometimes it generates counters, sometimes it generates uh, uh, gauges. We don't really have a say in that. Another problem that we often see is mixed modes. Um, this would happen, for example, when you uh, send a metric of a transaction, but you don't separate between the different modes of the transaction. Uh, for example, you send the errors and the success at the same time. Okay, what happens then? Let's see. So this is a mixed timer, and this is a mixed gauge. And here you can actually see both, the mo both modes. You can see um, that, uh, for example, the gauge, I've had uh, successes and, and OK transactions. Um, they were both very, very stable. But if I look at the mixed metric, the metric that actually includes both, it looks very, very unstable. And because that's because aggregation is lost. Um, in every time window, I would get the last value, which basically is random between you know, either OK or success. I have no idea what I'm going to get. So it just fluctu fluctuates uh, randomly between no two values. This metric is completely useless. Okay, um, this is a badly designed metric. And with timers, I would get similar behavior. 
but it depends again on the aggregation. So if I use uh, Apple 99, what do you think would happen with, uh, with two transactions? One that is fast, the L's, and one that is slow, the actual successes, the actual transactions that succeeded. Um, basically, I've wiped out one metric. With P99, I would only get the, the slow metric. So you can see here that, um, that this metric here, around uh, this is uh, both timers together, 99% of both timers together, around 1.2, uh, sorry, 1200 uh, milliseconds, is actually almost the same as the OK metric. It's actually exactly the same. So I've basically erased all the data I had about L's. Um, if I used a different aggregation, let's say um, uh, median, again, because of the, of the, the uh, very different values of the L's and the uh, OK metrics, I would just lose one of them. Okay? So either I get a completely unusable metric, or I, use, or I get a metric you know, without the, the values of the other, the other type of transaction. So what is the solution to this? How would you solve this? Anyone? So, wait. Exactly. Separate the counters, separate the gauges. Send two metrics instead of one. And this is relevant, for example, for web servers where we have more than one type of transaction and uh, not all transactions have the same speed, same latency, same sizes, and so on. If we know upfront the different modes, we want to generate different metrics for each type of transaction. And you have to multiply that by two, because for every transaction, there's also an error mode, okay? And usually an error mode would be a lot faster than, you know, the uh, OK mode of that uh, transaction. So the final part, because um, I think we're out of time, okay, is uh, building useful graphs. How do we build useful graphs? So just want to show you something. Um, this is not the default view of Kibana, of, sorry, not Kibana, of, uh, of Grafana. Um, anybody who used Grafana knows that the default uh, is actually black. I can change it if you want to see it. It's a bit ugly. I need to sign out. Yeah. So this is the default. And obviously, I've personalized it. Anyway, the default is black. And uh, the default is very, very bad. It, it really um, prevents you from seeing stuff. Um, also, the default, by default, when I create a graph, so let me create a graph. You can see that I have this uh, very nicely looking area on the, on the bottom. Now this looks really good until I start adding metrics. So for example, I would use, let's add, um, let's add CPU. Okay, this looks horrible, right? This is not really usable. Sorry, sign out. Why is this not usable? First of all, because of um, the filling. The just kind of overlays on, each, on top of each other. The second reason is we basically have too many lines plotted on the same graph. So never do that. So basically what you want to do is first of all, never put more than three series on a graph, OK? Um, if it's CPU, then it's OK to stack it up to 100%, all of them. Um, but anything else, never do this. It's just confusing. Um, often I would see people that have a cluster of 10 machines. They would just plot all 10 machines on the same graph. You can't make anything out of it. You have no idea which machine is behaving in what, in what way. 
when you're working with a cluster, you usually want just to show the aggregates of that cluster, not the, each machine, or most deviant if you, uh, if you really care about the individual, individual machines. Now, make sure that you have a reasonable time frame. If you're looking for problems that happened in, uh, recently, don't show a graph of the entire day. Show a graph of one day, of one hour, for example. If you need a reference, show a graph of yesterday and today, but in two different graphs. Don't put them on, on, on one you know, big time scale, because it's impossible to understand what goes on, and also you will suffer from peak erosion. Um, multiple wire scales, when you're, showing, when you're plotting, for example, uh, memory versus latency, which are two very, very different numbers in scale, and it's very tempting to scale one graph so you can actually see the other one and use multiple y-axis for that. It's very, very tempting. Try to avoid that. Create, create two graphs instead. Um, when you're using multiple uh, y-scales, it's confusing to the eye. And only put related uh, series on the same graph. Okay? Again, if you're plotting memory and latency at the same time, it's confusing. You don't want to be doing that. Never, ever, ever, ever mix x-scales. If you're building a dashboard, Try not to put graphs on days and weeks at the same time. It confuses everyone, really. Um, you have no idea how many times I've seen people, you know, find bugs that weren't even in, that didn't exist because they thought they were looking at a, a one-day time scale when they were actually looking at a one-hour time scale and so on. Now, also, it's very important to have visual references. For example, if you remember that I plotted the thresholds as a line. This is a visual reference. It's very, very important. It helps you to understand whether this is an actual problem or maybe it's just a fl tiny fluctuation that you know, is, is normal for that kind of metric. Um, every metric, everything in life has some kind of variance. Often that variance is insignificant. How do we know if it's significant or insignificant? Depends on, again, the, the zoom. For, so for example, if, you, if I want to go to my boss and get uh, you know, a lot of money to fix a problem that doesn't even exist, um, I would probably show him, you know, let's uh, pick a graph. Let's pick this graph. I would take this graph and I would, uh, you know, go here and uh, change the scale a bit. Let's say five. Oh my God, I have a problem. The system is behaving horribly. I need a lot of money to fix this. Oh, everything's fine. There is no problem. The company is not losing any money. This is the effect of scale and visual references. This is why it's very, very important to tune up front the scale of your graphs, especially on dashboards. Um, often people leave it in the default mode, which is auto scale. And what happens with all the scale? If you don't have any peaks, or if you have a tiny peak, you would think it's a huge peak because the system auto scale to that peak. Okay? So if you're building a dashboard, make sure you decide up front what kind of value you would consider to be abnormal. Is it 100? Is it 1,000? And tune the scale of the graph accordingly. So let's go back. Legend. Who puts legends on the graphs? Ooh, like 10 people. Put legends on your graphs, for God's sakes. Um, it's very important, and if you put legends, try to also put representative values. And when I say representative values, I don't mean the average. I mean the minimum and maximum values of that graph. Okay? The average is misleading, normally, but the maximum and minimum values will actually tell you a lot about the scale of the graph. So they're important, so put them there. Now, um, just a quick summary of metric design. The most important thing to do when you're designing a metric is to choose the aggregates wisely, to choose them according to the type of metric that you have, whether it's a timer, whether it's a gauge, whether it's a counter, and so on, and to decide on the resolution properly, okay? The sampling rate and the time windows. By the way, if you have incompatible time windows, for example, you're sampling every one minute, but your aggregator works in, uh, let's say, two-minute intervals, you would get weird results. 
if your aggregator works in a high resolution, let's say 10 minutes in 10 seconds, and you're sampling at one minute rate, you're going to get holes in the graph and a lot of artifacts. So try to make sure that you know, time windows uh, are consistent with each other. Explore the distribution. Capture some raw data, say an hour, a day, um, you know, whatever number you can store on the Elasticsearch or whatever, and explore the distribution with histograms. It's going to tell you a lot about what kind of aggregates you want to use. Uh, do I want 99th percentile? Do I want 99.9th .9 percentile? Maybe I want the bottom uh, the percentiles, like 1 percentile and so on. Um, it's very hard to know that without exploring the distribution visually. One thing you will also discover from this distribution, how many modes do you have? Is my distribution bimodal, trimodal, and so on? And that will tell you a lot about um, how many metrics you need. How many, uh, what kind of separations of metrics uh, do I need? Um, we're not going to go over that, but basically, um, when you're working on metrics in Graphite, you've got a bunch of functions that allow you to um, separate the signal from noise. For example, um, moving average is a type of low-pass filter that allows you to smooth. I'm just going to show that, and uh, so you'll see the power of that. So this is the high resolution gauge that we've seen before. And I'm going to uh, use Yes. Does anybody see it? Mm. Yeah, probably. Is it? No, it's not. I don't think it's a filter, but maybe. Yeah, moving average. Yeah, all right, it's a filter. Nice. Thanks. So let's do this and turn off everything else so we actually see something. Okay. So this is the metric, and uh, we're going to do a moving average. We're going to increase the moving average. You will see the metric change. Okay. Stay quiet right now and zoom into that window. Okay, so basically this smooths out all the peaks. Okay, so let's uh, take it to low resolution. This was the original metric. That's smoothing and more smoothing. Okay, it basically uh, removes all the noise, just leaves the uh, slow changes, so to speak. So it removes uh, the higher frequencies and remove and leaves uh, the the slow changes basically. Um, just one problem you need to know about with moving average, it has a tendency to, to shift the peaks slightly, um, but it doesn't actually remove the phenomenon. It does help you show, um, does help you uh, see the slow changes in the graph. Okay? So a very useful tool. Um, I would recommend that you go and read about uh, the graphite metrics. They're very, very useful. A lot of the other um, uh, metric um, services have uh, you know, functions that you can use in order to um, to do efficient um, data analysis. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, if you've got any questions, that would be awesome or not. Don't ask me about that picture because I have no idea. I don't think anybody does. So do we have any questions here? All right, then I would say thank you very much, Avishai, for this awesome talk. <laughs>